Next speaker, probably the most followed on Twitter by um, of anybody in the room, <laughs> having surpassed the 20,000 mark not that long ago, but the, the, the Venerable Peter Schuster. Thank you. Um, right, thanks for these uh, wonderful talks before me. I think, uh, whilst my slides are getting ready, I'll just say that, yeah, it's interesting. Integration, psychedelic integration does seem to be a new thing. Um, but... Realistically, that's where we are at the moment, you know, and there's a lot of funding and there's a lot of trials going on on integration. And that will happen, I think, for at least 10 more years, if not longer. So my paper is about um, the experience a little bit more, or an aspect of the experience, which is what I call metaphysical experience. Um, it's based on a paper I wrote last year on the need for metaphysics and psychedelic therapy and research. Why did I write this paper? We've got this psychedelic colloquium here at Exeter. I know a number of you um, frequent. And um, people came in, a lot of scientists, psychologists, psychiatrists came in. They were talking about you know, mystical experiences slash supernatural slash paranormal slash numinous. And then they said slash metaphysical. And I thought, no, 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 no. You can't, you, metaphysics means something quite specific. It's one of the three sort of core, core pillars of philosophy. So I thought then, okay, maybe it would be useful if um, scientists, in the English sense of the word, sort of knew what metaphysics was in the philosophic legacy. And then I thought, actually, furthermore, maybe um, understanding metaphysics a little bit more will help um, certain um, clinical integrations. And But not only in the clinic, I think a greater knowledge of metaphysics will help people generally who are not ill necessarily, but are well, you know, in inverted commas, um, understand their experiences a little bit more because we have 3,000 years of this in the philosophic canon, not just in the West, but in the East and around the world. And anyway, so I thought this, and then I realized that someone else had thought it already, unfortunately. Albert Hoffman, he wrote this in his um, autobiography, LSD, My Problem Child, from 1979, in the last chapter. He writes, a type of, quote, a type of med medicine, metapsychology, is beginning to call upon the metaphysical element in people and to make, we should make this element a basic healing principle and therapeutic practice. So there you have the sort of um, discoverer slash synthesizer of LSD make the same point. And, you know, like um, Albert Hoffman, he was a chemist, of course, but he was good friends with the German philosopher Ernst Jünger, and uh, he, had, he had a lot of interest in philosophy. Anyway, so, okay, uh, this is my plan in how much, how, what do I have, 20 minutes or so, right? Okay, it's going to be fast. 20, okay. <laughs> I'm going to make a primary point, and then I'm going to explain what metaphysics is. Um, I'm going to talk about metaphysics quickly in relation to mysticism. They are not the same thing. Um, then I'm going to give you some examples of psychedelic-induced metaphysical experiences, um, and then quickly about how to possibly um, inter use it for integration. Here's my primary point. Um, psychedelic-induced metaphysical experiences will be more adequately comprehended and integrated with recourse to metaphysics. Right, that's true by definition, I'd say, a tautology almost. But yet it is not. What the hell is metaphysics? Well, there's a, you know, people use it sort of willy-nilly. Um, but like I say, it's got quite a strict meaning in philosophy. Um, I should say as well in philosophy, uh, for the most of the 20th century, metaphysics was a dirty word. I think it still is for many people. Um, it was um, A.J. Eyre wrote an article in the 1930s talking about the meaninglessness, the nonsense of metaphysics partly as a reaction to the British idealists in Oxford and Scotland. And this kind of philosophy of language, this reductive philosophy took over. And only in the last 20, 30 years in philosophy has there been what we call the metaphysical turn. So we've suddenly taken metaphysics more seriously again. We teach it here at Exeter, I've taught it. Um, and it's sort of, the metaphysical turn came just before the psychedelic turn or the psychedelic renaissance, so-called. And um, this talk sort of aims to bring those two turns together. What is metaphysics? Well, it comes from the um, title of Aristotle's book, Metaphysics. He didn't call it that. It was called that by a later editor who basically put this collection of texts after meta, his book, The Physics. Um, that's why it's got its name. Um, meta means after or beyond. And the content of that book pretty much determines what metaphysics is today. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can see it concerns ontology, the study of being. Being qua being is what Aristotle called it. The sort, of re the sort of research into existence being. Um, I'll go into the substance part in a moment, um, but 
metaphysics generally is quite a dry subject at university. It involves like questions such as what is causation? What, are, uh, what is space time? What is the eternal timeless? What are properties relations? What is, possib what is possibility? Does possibilities exist or do they not exist? Actuality, necessity, et cetera, et cetera. Also, I should say, book Lambda in the, in, in the metaphysics was about God, was theology. So uh, theology, you can see, is, is subsumed by metaphysics. Aristotle's God in that section was not, nothing like the Christian God, though. It was simply thought, thinking about itself, a very abstract notion of God. Anyway, um, what I'm more interested in personally is metaphysics of mind. So that's the sort of first row there, um, where we talk about what ultimately is reality. What is, this, what is the stuff of reality? Um, and there are many different um, takes on that. Um, as a result, I've created this metaphysics matrix um, with help from Rene Joseph here in yeah. the paper. Um, and I'm quickly going to go through that in a sort of simplified sense here. So, um, so Andy was just talking about physicalism. He was returned to physicalism, and there is in in the in the West, I think, a belief that one metaphysical view is neutral, is true, absolutely true, and then there are all these weird woo other theories, right? And in fact, many people I notice think there are only two options. There's either physicalism, which is very with many forms of that, but very basically that the universe fundamentally is, consists of matter or the physical, um, and dualism. Either, and so there's that physical, and then there's the mental as some kind of soul, transcendent of it. But there are many other options. And these other options relate to many psychedelic experiences. Not all, but some, as we shall see. What are these options? Um, uh, well, very basically, so there's substance dualism. Um, and this is the belief that um, yeah, that one has a soul. When one dies, the soul maybe exists. The next four here are um, physicalisms. So we've got eliminativism. So in the 20th century, um, science couldn't really work out what the mind was, consciousness was, thought metaphysics was rubbish. And so there, was, there were a number of people who thought there is no such thing as consciousness. Eliminativism, it just doesn't exist. Um, but this sort of met with many paradoxes, the belief that there are no beliefs, stuff like that. Um, Another physicalism is epiphenomenalism, which was touted by old Huxley's grandfather, Thomas Huxley. It's a view that the brain creates the mind, but the mind has no power back on the body or brain. Um, the probably probably the, the, the dominant view now, and I think Rebus is an example, is a subtype of this, um, emergentism. And that's the view that the brain produces the mind, but also the mind has an effect back on the brain and body. Because why would it have evolved if it doesn't it do anything? This is the argument. Um, how that mental causation works is a big problem, which in my view falsifies the whole theory. Um, but but I, I think that's a dominant paradigm. The brain produces the mind today, but the mind has power. Um, another view, another physicalist view is that um, is called psychoneural identity theory, and that's simply that the brain is the mind. It's not that the brain produces the mind, rather it's the same thing, seen from two different aspects. That was um, refuted in a paper in the 60s regarding octopuses. Um, I can't get into it uh, in, in the break. Um, panpsychism, I did my PhD in panpsychism, and that's the view that brain and, or rather body and mind are the same thing, seen from different angles, but by body, I mean all bodies. So plants have basic forms of consciousness, uh, amoeba, insects, and so on. Um, and there are many panpsychological psychedelic experiences, as, as I shall show you. And there's also, it's interestingly related to the animism, which I think you see in many other cultures, like indigenous Americas, Shintoism, and so on. Um, idealism, another view, which Bernardo Castro and people like that take on today, which is that matter is not the fundamental thing, rather mind is. Mind is fundamental, matter is a projection. And then lastly, there's a neutral monism, which is the view that neither mind nor matter are fundamental of reality. Rather, the sort of purple triangle here is fundamental, and mind and matter are expressions of that fundamental substance. That's why they correlate in brain scans and so on. Um, and then another view is the that there exists the transcendent. So beyond mind and matter, there are, for example, ideal forms of justice, beauty, truth, uh, mathematical truths, and so on. 
Platonism. Now, as uh, no, well, don't look. <laughs> Nothing happened here. Oh god, I got way too many slides on that. Jesus. Um, all right. Now you might think I'm not interested in metaphysics. It's just like philosophers in the ivory towers discussing things which aren't important. But as Alfred North Whitehead said, if you don't go into metaphysics, you assume an uncritical metaphysics. Your 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 culture gives you a metaphysics. I didn't realize it when I was went to school here in England and in Sweden. But you're sort of imbued with a metaphysics. It's never spoken of, but it's just the default position, and that's physicalism. As I said, physicalism in in, in Europe since 17th century, really. But that's very that's just one of many options, and it's very problematic. They're all very problematic, but um, so is that, and it's problematic, and we see its problem problem. Problemicity, is that what? Um, with the hard problem of consciousness, right? So it's very quickly, it's it's the question as how the hell does like meat, like moving meat or electricity in the skull, how does that make emerge if emergence is even true? Like curiosity and pain and pleasure and aesthetic appreciation of poems and stuff like that. How does that just come from things moving? What's the relationship? David Chalmers, who coined the hard problem of consciousness, though it's a very old problem in philosophy, mind, mind body problem, it used to be called, says this the hard problem, why is all this physiological processing accompanied by an experienced inner life? A solution to this problem may profoundly affect our conception of the universe and of ourselves. In other words, our metaphysical viewpoint. And it's no good simply making a, as the great philosopher of mind, Jay Kim, said, Quote, making a running list of psychoneural correlations does not come anywhere near gaining an explanatory insight into why there are such correlations. You won't work this out just looking at the brain. That's part of it, but it's not all of it. Can't be. So the mind-matter problem, the hard problem of consciousness, keeps the metaphysical options open for interpreting psychedelic experience. Because nobody agrees, I mean, maybe some people know what the answer is. Some people, some people certainly think they know, but nobody agrees. Nobody agrees on this. So the mind matter problem keeps the metaphysical options open for interpreting psychedelic experience. In other words, if you do have, let's say, a panpsychist experience or an idealist experience or an animist experience, can you simply call it a delusion, a hallucination? Well, you can if you know what reality is, if you know the answer to these problems in the metaphysical mind. But I would, I would uh, say that people don't know this. So we have to be open-minded. So metaphysical experiences. Um, so metaphysics, very, very quickly, um, you can study metaphysics, like Spinoza's work, for example, or Whitehead's work or whatever. Um, I call that intellectual metaphysics. That can be split into systematics. So you've got Spinoza's system, Leibniz's system, and so on. Um, or it can be analytic. So in, in, in the university now, you generally study like causation or stuff, stuff like that, you know, modality, bitty. So metaphysics can be intellectual. You can study it. But it can also be experiential, a bit like music. You could study, you could, you know, a deaf person, congenitally deaf person could study music um, and know a lot about it, but until they've experienced music, they don't know the full picture. So same with metaphysics. You can study it, but you can also experience it. William James, for example, says, in the nitrous oxides trance, we have a genuine metaphysical revelation, 1902. Mysticism also splits, of course, into the experiential, but also the doctrinal, when you look at St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, with Roman Catholicism or whatever. Now, so there's an overlap between metaphysics and mysticism, but they're not the same thing. And there's an overlap with psychedelic experience. And I'm not saying, I'm certainly not imposing the view that psychedelic experiences are metaphysical. Some of them are. Other psychedelic experiences are to do with laughter, having a good time, turning into a piano, locating a lost object, um, becoming a better hunter, a better fighter, whatever it may be. But some experiences are metaphysical, induced by psychedelics, and that's what I'm interested in. Now, at the moment, um, there are these mysticism questionnaires, the MEQ, which comes back, goes back to Walter Stace and William James and so on. Um, mysticism stays at the level of mystique, but metaphysics can help explain or seek to explain experiential metaphysics and mystical experience. So in other words, with metaphysics, you don't just get the experience, you have the, you have the intellectual side as well. You have the um, proposed explanation of what you are seeing. Metaphysics can therefore be of use in integrating psychedelic, induced, mystical, and metaphysical experiences. 
So it's not just about talk, having the experience and uh, then talking about your mother or something. You can actually, in theory, talk about the experience and then possibly fit it into the numerous varieties of metaphysics, not imposing a particular one. Um, so what am I, what, let's get a bit more concrete. What am I talking about? And how much time do I have? Five minutes, Jesus. Right, okay. Um, so here's an expert. I'm going to talk about metaphysical experience induced by psychedelics. Here's one from 1957. Before panpsychism became sort of um, a thing again. I realized from Richard Ward, a drug taker's notes, his uh, reports on LSD. I realized on 100 micrograms LSD that the whole universe is made up of things which have their own natures, relationships, significances, and that in some universal scale, each thing has its proper degree of awareness. Alan Watts' classic on pantheism, the view that nature is God. Quote, the individual discovers himself to be one continuous process with God and with the universe. To those who have known it, it is as real and overwhelming as falling in love. I'm actually writing a paper at the moment on pantheism and psychedelic therapy. I'll tell you about that later, although I've delayed it five times now, so maybe it will get cancelled. Um, I, oh, God, have I, got I just added this yesterday. I'll just read this to you. This is from Alan Watts, actually. Quote, the undoubted mystical and religious intent of most users of psychedelics requires their free and responsible use to be exempt from legal restraint in any republic that maintains a constitutional separation of church state. Under present laws, I, as an experienced student of psychology or religion, can no longer pursue research in the field. This is 1968. This is a barbarous restriction of spiritual intellectual freedom, suggesting that the legal, systems of, legal system of the United States is, after all, in tacit alliance with the monarchical theory of the universe. Christianity he's talking about here, or Abrahamic religions, and will therefore prohibit and persecute religious ideas and practices based on an organic and unitary vision of the universe, in other words, pantheism. In fact, um, he proposed, he was once an ordained Anglican priest, he proposed to write an essay on the police as armed clergymen in this respect. Unfortunately, never wrote it. Um, other nature connectedness uh, Christine spoke about, here's a very good example about coming a daffodil and having an orgasm, can't read it. Um, <laughs> um, uh, memory, very interesting, what we call panoramic memories. Uh, this is from Oliver Sacks' book, Hallucinations, Misnomer. Then my whole life flashed in my mind from birth to present with every detail that ever happened, every feeling and thought, visual and emotion was there in an instant. Why is that metaphysically interesting? Well, uh, <laughs> Bergson argued that memories are never lost. Memory exists, the past exists, only access to them is lost. And um, William James was very much inspired by that, and so was Old Taxi. But, you know, back in 1821, this was um, written by um, Thomas de Quincey, this great English writer, Kant, Kant commentator. Uh, just quickly, he wrote this. This is on opium, high dose of opium, I should say. Quote, the minutest instance of childhood or, for or forgotten scenes of later years were often revived. I recognized them instantaneously. I felt assured that there is no such thing as ultimate forgetting. Traces once impressed upon the memory are indestructible. A thousand accidents may and will interpose a veil between our present consciousness and the secret inscriptions of the mind. Accidents of the same sort will also rend away this veil, but alike, whether veiled or unveiled, inscription remains forever, just as the stars seem to withdraw before the common light of day. Stars are always there. We don't always have access to them. Same with memories. This is an old, old view, and there's actually good philosophical reason to believe it, but that's another talk. Um, Bergson himself wrote, the body is a filter. If these bodily mechanisms go out of order, e.g. with drugs, the door which they kept shut opens a little way. There enters something of a without, which may be a beyond. I have not time to talk about that. Um, anyway, Bergson argue, uh, influenced Huxley in the doors of perception. Paper is out, actually. No, it's, it's forthcoming. Let's write a paper on this coming out in the, what's it called now? Palgrave Macmillan Handbook of Psychoactive Drug Use. Anyway, um, I love reading this one. I've got one minute, right? <laughs> uh, this is Entities, another metaphysical experience. Rick Strassman, DMT patient. As I accepted my death into solution, into God's love, the insect always began to feed on my heart, devouring the feelings of love and surrender. They feasted, uh, feasted as they made love to me. It was extremely alien, though not necessarily unpleasant. Animism, our friend, Dr. Luis Eduardo Luna. Quote, it's impossible to understand Amerindian animist culture without reference to these psychedelic plants. In fact, when I'm chairing the next session, I'm going to talk about this if I get a chance. Okay, and there's many others. Not all good. This is a horrific thing. A Benny Shannon says, actually, ayahuasca induces a comprehensive metaphysical view of things. I would characterize it as idealistic monism with pantheistic overtones. Um, Hoffman was, quote, quotes Goethe, quoting Spinoza, and I've done a paper on that. 
Um, anyway, okay, primary point again. Psychedelic-induced metaphysical experience should be integrated with recourse to metaphysics. Uh, unlike most other forms of therapy, psychedelic ther therapy often involves metaphysical experience, but psycho psychotherapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, so on, are not trained in metaphysics. It is not in their professional ambit yet. So my conjecture is simply this, offering a patient an additional and optional discussion. So I'm not saying replace what already exists. I'm just saying as a, an additional tool that could be used in integration, but also in, in, in for, for, for the wider wellness of things. Um, anyway, discussing a scheme of metaphysical perspectives like metaphysics matrix uh, for integration may extend long-term benefits of psychedelic therapy and beyond. It's conjecture, it might not be true, but it can be tested. Um, I think basically it's just a greater understanding of certain psychedelic experiences can help people integrate that into their lives by understanding what they are going through or at least seeing how people have interpreted the, these experiences in the past. And that's it. Thank you. Have you ever thought about doing terms and conditions on radio adverts? Uh, could could be a could be an earner. Um, 